Some of you may have heard of the MPTCP working group in the IETF. Um, the MPTCP working group is working on multipath congestion control, which is exactly what I'm going to talk about. In fact, I'm going to be talking about the congestion control which went into the uh, uh, MPTCP protocol. Okay. Um, to um, set up the high-level question that we're trying to solve in this paper, I want to start off with some ancient history. I want to talk about circuit switching versus packet switching. In the beginning, there was circuit switching. Um, so with circuit switching, you have a dedicated channel, a dedicated circuit for each flow, and a flow is simply not allowed to stray outside its circuit. And this is rigid and inflexible. Quite clearly, if there's a sudden surge of traffic on one of the flows, and there's space if the other flow is quiet, you'd like it to be able to fit in. And that's exactly what packet switching does. It lets you think about the link as a whole. You just think about this is a link with a 10 megabit per second capacity. You don't worry about its division into circuits. Packet switching lets you just use the link as a uh, undifferentiated resource. And there's an exact parallel between packet switching and multipath. Let me illustrate it. Here I've drawn two separate links with two separate flows. Now if there's a surge in one of the flows, if let's say the yellow flow has a surge, it just makes sense that you should like it to be able to use unused capacity elsewhere in the network. And multipath lets this happen. If each of the flows is able to use both of the links, then you can accommodate surges quite happily. So in that sense, I would like to talk about multipath as packet switching 2.0. It's a way of being able to talk about aggregates of links rather than links on their own. But circuit switching isn't all bad. Circuit switching has some very nice properties. It gives you very strong isolation. If one flow, with circuit switching, one flow simply can't harm the other flows. As soon as you do away with that control, if you go into packet switching, you need to introduce a new control thing to make sure that the capacity is shared fairly, that the link is shared properly. And um, that's what TCP does. TCP is a way of ensuring proper sharing of a link. And my question for this talk, the big question is, what's the proper way to think about how to control sharing of a uh, uh, aggregate of links? Right, that's a very high level view of what we're trying to answer. I want to give some more concrete examples. So here's a very tangible example. This is a picture of a B-cube data center. Let's say we have a data center and there's one flow active, this red flow. It's using a, a certain path. And then there's a new flow which wants to start, indicated by these, uh, between these two, two uh, uh, hosts. Um, its direct route, the direct route between those two hosts just happens to clash, collide with the, uh, uh, the first flow that was there. However, this B cube, it's got a very richly connected topology. There are other paths available which wouldn't clash. So if we have multipath, then is there some way we can use that to make more efficient use of the network? Here's another example. Let's suppose, like, like most of you, I have a phone with two interfaces, Wi-Fi and 3G. Um, it's very desirable to be able to use both links at the same time. Um, it would be great if I could get the throughput of Wi-Fi and the resilience of 3G. But it doesn't really seem fair that I should just blast out at full rate on both interfaces. Maybe I, that would hurt other users of the network. So is there a way I can use both interfaces effectively and balance my traffic without harming other people? And what's particularly hard here is that the, the, the links, the interfaces, will have very different characteristics, very different loss rates, very different round trip times. What's the right way to think about balancing traffic? So there are two very tangible questions about multipath which I'm going to address. Um, obviously, I don't want to just solve these two specific problems. I want to come up with a multipath protocol. We want to come up with a multipath protocol which will work for all sorts of networks. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, for most of this talk, is try and formulate some design goals for what multipath congestion control ought to be doing. Um, there's been a lot of work done on, on enhancements to TCP. There, there are evaluation suites for how you judge if a new 
TCP congestion control, TCP-like congestion control algorithm is, is fair or if it's any good. There are simply no such evaluation suites for multipath. So a large part of this work has been trying to develop an appropriate way of thinking about how we should evaluate multipath. So I'm going to propose design goals, illustrate what those design goals mean in certain simple scenarios, and then I'll show experimental results and simulation results from the algorithm we implemented to solve these. Um, before I go on to the design goals, I want to say briefly what the actual MTP TCP protocol looks like. It's, it's nice to have something tangible in mind. The protocol upon which we've actually implemented this, um, we have MP TCP running at the sender and at the receiver. Um, it's just a replacement for TCP. We imagine that either the sender or the receiver has multiple addresses, so the sender, when it has packets to send, it stripes them across the different connections it has. The receiver uh, uh, reorders the packets, puts them into the correct order. But whether it's on top of MPTCP protocol or whether you're interested in producing a multipath version of your favorite TCP, if you're interested in multipath compound TCP or, or multipath congestion control for SCTP, I don't really care. I'm just going to talk about congestion control in the abstract. However, all our simulations run on this specific protocol. Okay, so on to the design goals. Design goal one, this is something that everyone thinks about when they think about uh, multipath. Um, I've, what I've drawn here is a single bottleneck link with two flows. One of them's a multipath flow, it's got two subflows, and it's competing with a single regular TCP flow. And common sense says that we would like to be fair in this case. It's not fair if the multipath flow grabs more bandwidth just because it's got more subflows. Um, there's a very straightforward solution to that. We could just make each of the subflows run congestion control much like TCP but half as aggressive. It's very easy to tune the aggressiveness of TCP by, by uh, uh, tweaking some of the parameters in there. So this is the obvious way to get multipath working fairly. Uh, I think design goal one, it's obvious that it doesn't, there's no point showing any experiments evaluating it. So let me move on to design goal two, which is a much more interesting design goal. What I've got here is a simple topology with three links, each link 12 megabit per second. And so far I've drawn on one multipath flow. This flow has a choice of a one hop path or a two hop path. I want to ask how should it split its traffic? Well, here it's not very hard. Let me make it a bit harder. Let me add in another flow, which also has a choice of one or two hop path. And for symmetry, I'm going to add in a third flow. Okay, so we have three flows here, each with a choice of one hop path or a two hop path. My question is, how would we like multipath tra traffic to split itself over the paths it has available? How is that straw man solution I proposed earlier going to work out here? Well, if each flow split its traffic evenly over the two paths it has available, this is what we, would happen. You can just work out how much uh, uh, capacity each of the subflows would get. The answer is, if you split your traffic evenly in this example, everyone gets eight megabits per second. If you shift your allocation in favor of the single hot paths, this is what happens. You get nine megabits per second. Let's bias it a little bit further, 10 megabits per second splitting with a split ratio of four to one. Um, the ultimate is to send absolutely all of your traffic on the direct path, on the one hop path in this case, then every flow here will get 12 megabits per second. Okay, so that tells us that the straw man solution of, of splitting your traffic evenly, it's good for fairness, but it's not good for efficiency. There is, in fact, a theoretical solution which, which says what the answer is for an arbitrary network. The answer for an arbitrary network is that each, if each of the multipath flows sends all of its traffic on its least congested paths, then you will end up with the best, most efficient outcome possible for this given network and the given set of paths. There's a, a theorem to that effect. Um, theorem. I, I, in, in, in this case, it's uh, uh, the, the proper people to quote are Kelly and Voice 2005 and Han and Towsley and others 2006. Okay, so that's a nice answer. That tells us, in general, in an arbitrary network, how to achieve an efficient allocation with multipath. 
Here's a, a tangible example of that. Um, this is the example I talked about right at the beginning of the talk of, of a B-cube data center. Uh, if you remember the example, we started off with one flow, the red flow. We imagined a new flow started, the white flow. The white flow has a choice of several paths. Which path should it choose? Well, what, the, what our MPTCP algorithm does is it follows that, that theoretical recommendation. It looks at the congestion on each of its paths. In this case, the path which collides with the red flow is more congested, so our MPTCP algorithm sh simply shifts its traffic away from the congested path. It avoids collisions in that way. Here are some examples. This is from a, a packet level simulation of, of MPTCP, and we're comparing it to that straw man solution which balances its traffic evenly. Um, the, uh, uh, on this graph, I've, uh, the graph shows, it's a bar chart showing the throughput that an average flow gets. And obviously the outcome depends on the traffic matrix you're running. Here we've run three separate traffic matrices. In the first two traffic matrices, evenly weighted TCP, that, that uh, simple straw man solution, and MPTCP, they're both as good. In our third case, we have a 19% a improvement over naive splitting of your traffic. Okay, so that, that was design goal number two. We should choose efficient paths. Moving on to design goal number three. This is actually highlighting a problem with design goal number two, an interesting problem. So let's think back to this uh, a problem of a, a mobile device got a choice of two paths, and we want to know how should we allocate our traffic between the two paths we have available, given that they have different characteristics. In our measurements, in our experiments, we found that, that the, uh, on the Wi-Fi interface, we typically had higher loss and small RTT. On the 3G interface, we had low loss and large RTT. That's presumably because the 3G protocols are, are doing lots of retransmissions. In order to do lots of retransmissions, they need a large buffer to hold the packets there. Um, whether or not that's a good strategy, I, I'm not going to argue that now. It's just what the network is like at the moment. And we want our MPTCP protocol to cope happily with whatever network we have. So let's think through what Design Goal 2 said. Design Goal 2, remember, it said, send all your traffic on the least congested path. Well, in this case, the least congested path is the 3G path. So Design Goal 2 says, send all your traffic on the 3G path. But the problem is, the 3G path has a very large RTT. So because it's got a large RTT, TCP just is not able to take very much capacity on that path. And so to be really unfair, if we were to take loads of capacity on that path, so we ought to limit ourselves to be fair to TCP flows, and this is a very undesirable outcome. By following design goal number two, choosing the most efficient path, we've ended up hurting the user. And obviously, if we hurt the user, no one will ever adopt our algorithm. Okay, so what do we do? What we did here is we, we tried to formulate a, a very precise, very formal statement of, of our fairness criteria. Our fairness criteria come in two parts. First part is we want there always to be an incentive for the user to deploy MTP TCP. Let me say that properly. A multi-path TCP user should get at least as much throughput as a single-path TCP would on the best of his available paths. So that's saying it should benefit the user. The next goal is, of course, it should not harm the network. And this is how we stated it. A multi-path TCP flow should take no more capacity on any link than a single-path TCP would on that link. So these are, I, I guess they're, they're intuitively obvious. It took us quite a long time to realize that this is what we were actually trying to solve. Let me walk through what these, these rules mean in a very concrete example. This is a, a picture of Kostin, uh, one of the co-authors and he's running multipass TCP on a laptop. He's got a Wi-Fi interface and a 3G interface. Um, for the first eight minutes of the trace, he's sitting in his office. And what I've shown on this graph, there's the, the x-axis is time, running from 0 to 12 minutes. And on the positive y-axis, I'm showing the throughput he's getting on his Wi-Fi interface. And on the negative y-axis, I'm showing the throughput he's getting on his 3G interface. So in other words, if you want to find out his total throughput, you need to add up the positive part and the negative part. Therefore, the total shaded area is his total throughput. All right, so first eight minutes he's sitting in his office. Um, what happens 
at eight minutes as he goes downstairs to get coffee. Um, the Wi-Fi signal is very poor in the staircase. Eventually, it completely cuts out, but because his, his, his flow survives because it's still running on 3G. He reaches the kitchen, and uh, he acquires a new Wi-Fi base station, and his flow just persists happily. So let me talk through the fairness goals and how they apply in this scenario. I'll just talk through the, the time in, in the office. All right, our fairness goals, oh, sorry, our, our, our design goal number two, use only the least congested path, says he should shift all of his traffic onto the 3G path because that's got lower loss. But then the fairness goal says you're not allowed to shift all your traffic onto the 3G path. You're only allowed to shift in, in today's conditions, in, in the conditions of this experiment, you weren't allowed more than 0.4 megabits per second. That's what TCP would get on a 3G path, and so we're not going to let multipath TCP take any more than TCP would get. So no more than 0.4 megabits per second on the 3G path. But on the other hand, the Wi-Fi path, if he used it only the Wi-Fi path, he would have got 2.2 megabits per second. So our algorithm basically says, this user is entitled to 2.2 megabits per second. We want to put as much of it as we can on 3G, and we'll put the remaining 1.8 megabits per second over the Wi-Fi path. So this is a, a very tangible example of, of, of our fairness goals in practice. Um, here I've, I've, I've simply given some numbers. It, 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 if you compare our MPTCP algorithm to the straw man proposal I described at the beginning, it's just not good to the user. In this case, the MPTCP is giving the user what he ought to be getting, and the straw man proposal is giving him 25% less throughput, so, so not good. Okay, so I've talked through three design goals so far. I've talked, said, you should be fair to TCP at bottlenecks. You should use efficient paths as much as you can while being fair to TCP. In fact, our goal three, is, that's a very precise statement of fairness. It, it subsumes completely goal one. Um, in the paper, we describe two further goals. Um, we'd like to adapt very quickly when congestion changes, and you better not oscillate, better not have root flap. I don't have time to talk through those two. What I want to talk about now, though, is how we actually achieved this. What, what, what does our protocol look like for solving all of these goals? Um, before I say what our algorithm is, I want to just recap what TCP is. TC, our algorithm is very closely based on TCP. So how does TCP congestion control work? TCP maintains a congestion window, W, on uh, every time you get an act back, you increase W, and every time you get a detector drop, you decrease W. So that's TCP. What's MPTCP, multipath congestion control? Well, we, we say, let there be a window parameter for each of your subflows, and we'll adjust the window parameters separately on each of them. Every time you get an ACK on a particular path, you'll increase the window for that path. Every time you get a drop on a path, you'll decrease the window for that path. And all the, all the brains of the algorithm are in this formula for the increase parameter. Let me, I'm not going to derive it. I'm, I'm going to give you some, some indications about where it's coming from. So let's look at design goal three. What did design goal three? Design goal three said you shouldn't take any more capacity on a link than the best of the TCP paths would. So this minimum term at the front, it's basically asking where might the bottlenecks be? Which of my paths might all be finding themselves sharing a bottleneck. The max asks, how much was, is the best of the single path TCPs going to get there? And the sum is saying, how much are we actually getting at the moment? So that min, max, and sum, they correspond to design goal three. Design goal two was saying that you want to shift traffic away from the most congested paths. You want to shift it towards the least congested paths. By and large, the least congested paths would be the ones with big window sizes. And so if you if you, bias, if you increase windows in proportion to window size, that has the effect of shifting traffic away from congestion. And so that explains a, a few more terms in the equation. Um, I, I should also say that, that um, it looks like a, a fiddly equation. It's, it's not terribly hard to implement if you're, if you're clever about how you program it. I guess at this point I could just stop. I mean, I've told you what our design goals are, and I've told you, um, I've told you what our algorithm is, but I have a bit more time. So I'm going to, um, 
I'm going to try and talk about the big picture of what uh, 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 MPTCP is, is, is trying to achieve. Um, I, I said at the beginning of the talk that I'm thinking of MPTCP as the control plane for managing collections of links. And there's a way you can make that precise. You can, you can come up with a fairly precise statement of what it means, what this control plane for collections of links is actually trying to solve. Um, to talk you through this, I, I, I want to give an example. This is a simple example, a multi-homed web server. Web server here has two access links, dual homed. Both of the access links are 100 megabits per second. At the moment, I've got two TCP flows on the top link and three TCP, sorry, four TCP flows on the bottom link. So the throughput you get, top TCP flows get 50 megabits per second each. Bottom TCP flows get 25 megabits per second each. That's straightforward. If you stick on one MPTCP flow, this is what it should get. It will send all of its traffic over the top link because that's less congested. If you add in another MPTCP flow, that's what it does. At this point, it's an interesting property. All of the eight flows are getting 25 megabits per second. It's as though the entire capacity, 100 plus 100, is being divided equally between the eight flows. And when we add more MPTCP flows, it still happens. The entire 200 megabits per second is still being shared out equally between all of the nine flows. That's just a consequence of the MPTCP algorithm. It's as though there's a single link of capacity, 200 megabits per second, and they're all sharing it. Um, I won't talk through this. This is simply an experiment which... which verifies that, that when you actually run the code in Linux on a web server, it does pretty much what, what, what those, those pictures were saying. Um, so let me, let me try and articulate what it is that this is actually achieving. MPTCP is trying to make a collection of links behave as though it was a single large pool of capacity. It's trying to make this pair of access links behave like 200 megabits per second. In other words, if there are n flows, we'd like that 200 megabits per second to divide, be divided fairly between all n flows. Um, which raises an interesting question. Can we make a data center behave like a single pooled capacity? Do we have to think about uh, uh, the individual paths? Do we have to worry about words like bisection bandwidth? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just assign a single number? This is a 8 terabit per second data center and not have to worry about paths or routing. MPTCP, we would hope, might be able to take care of all of that. Basically, what topologies and path choices would, would permit us to, to, to operate a data center in that way? Um, uh, let me quickly finish with some questions. Um, first question I've, I've raised, it's about how, well, I asked how can we pull the data center more broadly? Can we get large chunks of the internet to form pools? Can we, can we, can we say... 80% of the internet is now forming a single resource pool. What would it mean for network operators if they own, only own 20% of the resource pool? It's interesting questions. Much more practical down-to-earth questions are, I talked about multipath TCP for TCP. We're just doing an add-on to TCP. I believe that all of our design principles should work just as well if, if we wanted to enhance compound TCP or cubic TCP or whatever it is, but, but um, we haven't looked at that yet. That's interesting work. Um, let me finish by saying, recapping what we've, we've done. Uh, in a sense, multipath is packet switching 2.0. It lets you share capacity between links, whereas packet switching was sharing capacity within a link over circuits. Just as packet switching needed TCP to tame it, Multipath needs MPTCP to tame it. MPTCP is trying to be TCP 2.0. It's basically a, a control plane which does traffic engineering. It does traffic engineering by the end systems alone. Um, and it works on the time scale of round trip times. Obviously, there are many ways to achieve traffic engineering. This is an interesting add to the mix. What we've done is we've formulated design goals and test scenarios for how multipath congestion control ought to work, and we designed implemented and evaluated MPTCP, which is our solution to those design goals. Thank you. Hi, 
Uh, this is Jason Lee from IAI. Uh, this is a very interesting work. Uh, got multiple questions for you. So the first one is a clarification. So you assume, you do assume that those MTTCP, they know the path information. Yes, okay. that's right. That's good. Then my real question is, how do you really operate? I mean, do you embed those logic in this MPTCP, for example, in this wireless case, you know, this dot four here, one dot eight there? Of course, you can do a testing that way, but in terms of operation, how do you tell your TCP protocol? How do they figure out in real time? This is all there is to it. There's an increase every time you get an act back okay. and a decrease every time you get a drop back. Right. And all of the brains, all, all, all of that stuff about equations and the throughput you deserve, it's implicit in this equation. What we did actually is we solved the throughput equation for, for this algorithm and we verified that the solution to the throughput equation for multipath meets all of the criteria which we, we Right, but I, my question is, you know, when you really put that into operation, you also mentioned, you know, this uh, be very adaptive and quickly. How quickly can this be in real operation? Because, you know, the protocol itself needs to depend on some probes, some measurements to figure out and to trigger, right? Do you have a separate trigger module or this uh, is embedded in your TCP protocol too? That, that's a, that's a, 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 an extremely good question. This, this observation that you need to be probing at a certain level in order to get proper information being fed back to you. That's something which we addressed in much greater detail in the, in the paper. Um, and ultimately, I'm, I'm going to give you a flippant answer and, and say that it all comes in the square term in this equation. The square terms on the numerator and the denominator are what imply that we're trying to send enough probe traffic in order to get enough of yeah. a reliable signal. Those depends on the probes, okay. And do you consider also those short-lived flows versus long-lived flows, you know, versus those heavy tail stuff? Because that may give you some implications. That's also a very good question. Basically, we, we don't yet have a, a, a very good answer about, if you have a flow which is three packets big, it's not worth opening up a new course, connection. Yeah. So quite where that threshold comes, when, you should start, when should you start exploring? When should you start trying to open new, new flows? We don't have a, have a terribly good answer for that at the moment. Okay. Um, what I expect would happen in a data center is that most of it will be long-lived flows. Long-lived flows will, with long-lived flows plus multipath TCP will effectively do traffic engineering, which will make life very comfortable for the short-lived flows. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank I'm, you. I'm costing bandwidth, so. Hi, Mike Peterman Princeton. Uh, actually, it's a related question to what was just asked. Um, so, in terms of short-lived flows or uh, in terms of discovery, can you comment about effectively, you know, the number of round-trip times or delay this would take to converge on each kind of the optimal solution on each path compared to if you were just doing, you know, slow start or something on one, on one path? It seems like you do need some more because uh, you're kind of Cross, you're moving information back and forth between these different paths. Yes. Um, let me see. The, the, um, I, I, I guess I should, um, let me go right to the end and bring up a slide of related work. The, the theory which we were drawing from is this work by Kelly and Voice, 2005, and, and Han and Talsley and others, 2006. What they did is they, they looked at control theoretic models of, of what multipath TCP ought to be doing. It's an idealized model, but from those models, what you're able to do is you're able to address these questions of how long does it take to converge. Effectively, the answer is your multipath TCP flow will converge extremely rapidly, as in a, a, a handful of round trip times to the correct total throughput. And then the time it takes to achieve the correct balance is more like a time scale of 10 to 20 round trip times. That's the rule of thumb from, from the, the outcome of the theoretical work. And just a, well, did, I was wondering if you tried to run this against any of the data center traffic um, matrices that are you know, starting to get published to see how it would actually behave in terms of the mixes of short and long flows or not yet? Um, We've, um, we've definitely done experiments with mixes of short and long flows. Um, uh, the, um, the outcome of all of that, I, I think I'll simply say that there's, there's exciting stuff and, and you should okay. talk to Costin, Thanks. please. Uh, hi, Gu Hui Wang from RISE. So you mentioned MPTCP uh, maintain one window, window for each path. So how does the end host know how many paths you have in the network? 
Um, the, way that, the way that the MPTCP protocol, the, the version we're working with, stands is that MPTCP replaces TCP in your protocol stack. We assume that both the client and the server are, sorry, both the sender and the receiver have got MPTCP installed. And they, they have a, when you open the connection, there's a negotiation using TCP op options where they, they ask each other, what addresses do you have? And, um, oh, so you maintain each address for each connection? This means uh, you need different IP address for different paths? Yes, exactly right. This, this, the, the IETF MPTCP proposal does require one or other side to have multiple addresses. The stuff I've, I've been describing about congestion control could work very happily on top of some other scheme for getting at, at the multiple paths. But um, um, Can I just add a, a simple clarification? So uh, if you have ECMP, as in if the network supports multipath, uh, you can just have one IP per host, per, and then you just open multiple subflows with different ports, and you will access the, the, the multiple paths network. So that's what we do for data centers, right? But all the paths are previously. Input, no, no, you don't know. So in, for data centers, you actually don't know where the paths are. You just open subflows, and you hope they'll go different ways. That's it. All right, uh, Sitsen, Princeton University. I guess this was covered by some other people, but my main question was, it seems like you're relying on multiplicity by IP addresses and I guess ECMP in the network to load balance things. So it seems to me that this would work well maybe if you had a high number of uh, subflows to paths, but that ratio was high. And given, I guess, maybe the lack of IP addresses over a wide area, can you comment on uh, how you expect things to, um, you know, whether this uh, would work as you expect? whether the load balancing would kick in as you expect in the wide area versus maybe in the data center where you do have maybe access to a lot of IP addresses, uh, as the gentleman was saying. One place where there would definitely be plenty of, of, of multiple addresses is for um, multi-homed web servers. All the serious large sites will be multi-homed, so that, that gives you multiple addresses for any piece of content. That's one simple way to get multiple addresses. So your canonical example here was kind of the multiplexing of wireless and 3G interfaces. I guess I was surprised that you're going to require tens of RTTs to kind of converge to a good solution because it seems like the, future, the next future of that use is going to be something like Hari's Cabernet stuff. Great, can we go put this on cars they're driving around and having 400 millisecond wireless sessions and also use 3G and both conditions are fluctuating very much. So uh, I guess I'm curious what you think congestion control is going to start looking like when we have really mobile devices? Um, let, let me just clarify that, that point about how long it takes to converge. I reckon that you would converge the correct total throughput in a matter of two or three RTTs. And if you had a, a, a set scenario with, with many different paths, it might take more like 20 or 30 RTTs. In a simple case where it's 3G plus Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi disappears, then all that's left is to converging to the correct total throughput means getting the correct throughput on your, your, other, your other interface. So in a simple setting like that, very fast, um, um, very quickly moving devices with only two interfaces, it ought to converge in a matter of a few RTTs. I guess I just think that a few RTTs is a lot when you're moving in at 3G RTTs. Point taken. <laughs>